Okay. Good morning, guys. That's, since Pastor mentioned it, let's look at Ephesians 4 real quick. Just want to show you something. It's really good. Because uh, never just come here because it's the time that you guys meet. Come here with purpose. In fact, better yet, wake up in the morning and have fellowship with the Lord and commune with Him and talk to Him and make sure you connect with Him before you show up here. That would be good too. Or what will happen is church attendance will take the place of knowing Him. And all of a sudden, Christianity will be, Christianity will be going to church instead of Christ-likeness. Don't let Christianity be church attendance. Let it be Christ-likeness. And in Christ-likeness, of course, you'll have a gathering of believers and a fellowship with one another. Amen? It's really important. We teach ourselves religion and don't even realize it. We'll go through the form of something without becoming that thing. Like it's not cool to sing holy is the lamb and you're the Lord and then not let him govern and decide your life. So I'm not scolding you or anything right now. What I'm saying is, man, let's wake up and be with him. Knowing him is what changes your life. You can't just serve the Lord. You know the Lord. If you, if you don't, if you don't get to know Him and have relationship, you'll actually be reduced to serving Him and trying to do good things in His name, and you'll feel indebted to Him instead of in relationship with Him. And then you'll not be sure if you're measuring up. And you could even inwardly get condemned without saying it. You could live far from Him even though your heart wants to be close. Am I making sense? Okay, so it's just good. Let's 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 look here quick because Pastor mentioned it and it just seemed important when he mentioned it to just touch something. It says he himself gave to be apostles and prophets. It's verse eleven. It's what Pastor Nathan mentioned: prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now look why he never intended you to recognize a gift or an anointing in a person's life to put them on a platform and surround them with a conference so they minister to everybody so that all the needs are met. If you read, the reason he put a gift in, in someone's life is so they impart the falsehood of grace, a falsehood of grace of that gift into the hearers, into the believers to equip them to walk the same and live the same. Like he never, he never made a man a prophet so he stands in front of a thousand people and just gives them all a word. It's so that he imparts a grace that they all begin to prophesy. There's a place for a prophet to point somebody out and give them a word in due season. I'm not against that. That's awesome. That's not the point of a prophet. The point, point of a prophet is to equip the saints in the gift of prophecy so they can all prophesy at times in their life and hear the Lord for people. Yeah? Isn't that cool? Watch this. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry watch for the building up of the body of Christ the edifying of the body of Christ watch this this is amazing till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of God to a complete man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so the reason these gifts are in the body is so that we're formed and perfected into His image and we begin to look like Him and live from who He is, His heart. Does this make sense? This is really important. And, 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 and I want you to understand the unity of the faith. Don't let that scare you. Don't think that that's an impossibility. It doesn't mean every one of us doctrinally agreeing on everything exactly the same. Some things are actually such misdemeanors that we get so hooked on them because we don't agree. We fight over them. We stereotype them. Well, they don't believe that. Well, you know, yeah, I don't go to that church because they don't believe this and that. Listen, if, if, if that little thing doesn't affect everyday purpose, it might not be as big as we're making it. You say, well, do you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or do you baptize in the name of Jesus only? And now we've created this big thing, and there's churches because of this, and churches because of this, and churches because of this, and 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 none of that has anything to do with everyday purpose. You could believe all the above, and or one of the above, and not the other, and still wake up and be like Him. Still wake up and walk in love. Still wake up and show mercy and make peace. You might believe it's pre-trib. You might believe it's mid-trib. You might believe it's post-trib. Man, don't build a doctrine and create a camp and let your whole life ministry just wrap around that thing and miss everyday purpose along the way. Because one day you'll find out you were either right or wrong, but you missed legacy. 
Oh, that's just good preaching, girl. And you're right on the front to get it. I like how we're on the front. They're on the front going, come on. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> but think about this. We get Romans says some people esteem one day different than the rest. Others esteem every day the same. But don't come down on each other and argue about it and try to change each other's mind because if what they do, they do before the Lord and unto the Lord, the Lord Himself is able to make them stand. It would be like Pastor Nathan and me have a relationship and I find out that he honors a, a day separate than the rest and he considers it a Sabbath to him and he just breaks away and he doesn't do and he's just alone with the Lord and doesn't do certain things. And, and, and I'm thinking, man, Nathan, and I say, come on, man, you got to get free. We're in a new covenant. This is New Testament. This is Jesus, man. You don't have to esteem it one day different than the rest. It's every day is the same, man. And all of a sudden, I'm trying to take what I believe is a liberty and push it on him as if he's bound. When the Bible says in Romans 14, if he's doing he's just as free as me. And it's the Lord that's able to make him stand. I might be doing the whole every day is the same from a religious liberal place and don't even have intimate fellowship with God and I might not be living every day under Him. I might just be pushing a doctrine. And He's doing it under the Lord and He has had total intimacy with Jesus and being changed in that place and I'm trying to make Him like me. <laughs> Isn't that something? So we got to learn to do things from the heart and do things that carry the weight of truth. Amen? So this unity of faith, here's the deal. Here's how we can have the unity of faith. In this small room right here, there's just a handful of us, but this is an army. Like if every face I'm looking at would begin to live with influence in their everyday sphere of influence and walk in the light as He's in the light and walk in love and make peace and show mercy, whoo, and not make it just about what God can do for us, but how God can make us more like Him. And we wake up every day and don't know how to complain anymore and make it all about me and how I feel and who's what and why I don't. And all of a sudden you wake up and just understand life is a gift and it's a little wisp and a vapor and you're just a pilgrim passing through. You're just passing through. So leave a mark on as many hearts. Plan Him into the lives of people because He's bloomed in you. Come on. Man, that's just a good word. Because this life is flying by. And you got people around you and you go to jobs and people and family and spheres of people. Man, if we can leave an impression, this room right here, the size of this room with the faces I see, if you just touch and love and walk encouraging every day and just throw away complaining and shine as a light in the midst of the world. Just imagine the impact this room, these faces could have in time. You can't even measure it. Just loving as you go. Just stopping along the way. Just pulling along the road if they're walking up the road and you see their face, you see they're hurting and they're just walking up the road and, and, and you just pull along the road because you have 20 seconds. And you just pull down the window. You okay? Yeah. You in a little bit of pain? Well, actually, yeah, I'm trying to walk it off. It seems like if I walk, I can listen. Listen, love you. Just want to pray for you and I'll be on my way. Just Lord Jesus, I thank you right now. Bam, bam, bam. They either go, oh, wow, or whoa, or whatever. And you just drive on away. There's no string attached to that. You're not selling nothing. You didn't hand them your business card and you didn't hold out a plate for an offering. You see what I'm saying? He's loving people. You're on the job and people are doing you wrong and you don't look like you know that. That freaks people out. They want to know why you ain't fighting back. They want to know why. They're... And all of a sudden you say, well, what's fighting back? Come on. Takes two to tango, one to make peace, fighting back. Nobody wins. I'm not a victim. They're not a villain. Nobody wins. It's just an ugly talk show and people choose sizes, sides and everybody loses. Come on. Why do you want to live like that? Why do you want to have attitudes that aren't in the heart of God? Why do you want to see men the way God never saw you? Why do you want to treat men like Jesus hasn't treated us? Come on, it's not enough to be forgiven. It's enough to become forgiveness. It's not enough to obtain mercy. It's enough to become merciful. There's a million things in life that are trying to decide who you are. Let one thing determine that, and His name is Jesus. Come on, everything's trying to eat your lunch. When you think you're in control, you're surely not. Something is making you the way you feel, the way you think, and who you are. Something is behind the scenes deciding you. 
It's a fact, man. There ain't no way around it. I don't care how in control you think you are. There's some reason to feel in that way. Something's at the root of your life making you that way. Just your need to be so independent. It's because of hurt and let down and unfulfilled. And all of a sudden you can do it better yourself or whatever. See, something is motivating you. And attitudes and issues, and that's, they're a dime a dozen. That doesn't make you special. That makes you like everybody that doesn't know him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's just good straight preaching right there on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Come on, you got a million reasons to not be okay if you look for them. You know, somebody does you wrong, why do you let that trump what Jesus did to change you? To make, why is it about everybody doing you right? Why isn't it about you becoming right? Come on, God never has ever let man change who he is. That's why he still has the power to change who they are. Come on, we're just so vulnerable sometimes. We just blow them with the wind and holy and hallelujah. And we don't realize that, man, we're to be changed forever. Rock solid, established in truth, unshakable, unmovable. Hell, high water, anything. He is Lord. Your best friend does you wrong. Come on, it's not the end of the world. It means your heart breaks for them. You understand that people are learning, growing, groping, making mistakes. You're not thrown by it, surprised by it. It's not going to alter the next five years of your life. Let's stop living that way. And let's let the truth make us free so we have something to give them when they fall. If you're just waiting for everybody to do you right, you're going to be so deceived in your life. And you're going to find one day you let everything else matter more when it didn't matter most. It's truth that makes you free. Not how everybody's doing you. And if, you, if we don't get this, we'll even slowly revert it over to God and wonder when we're going to catch a break and what He's doing and when is He going to deal us a fair hand and why is He letting me go through this and why is He allowing all this? And next thing you know, we'll realize it's been all about me even though I've been singing it's all about Him. Watch it. I don't know why I'm doing this right now, but I hope you're okay because I'm not spanking. You don't feel spanked, do you? Look, I want to edify you and encourage you to live why He came and never get religious without realizing. I don't want the favor of the Lord. I want the heart of the Lord. Because in the heart of the Lord, I've found His favor. I don't want the blessing of the Lord. I want the nature of the Lord. In his nature, I find the blessing. And I'm looking for full vats and barns and favor and breakthrough. I'm looking for him. And in him, I find all those things abundant. And all of a sudden, I realize it's not even about me anymore. It's about him in me. And if I miss that, I miss the point. It's called the unit. This is why I'm preaching this, because that one line... It's Ephesians 4 fault. So it's his fault. <laughs> this morning's his fault. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so if it goes well, yay. <laughs> and if not, <laughs> just having fun. <laughs> the unity of faith. Here's what it is. In, our, in, this, in this small room with just these number of faces, which is an army and can change society if we walk this truth. But watch this. Watch this. There is so much diversity in this room. Flavor, preferences, callings, vision, purpose, burnings, anointings. There's people that have kids on their heart. There's people that love worship and music. There's people that love dreams and they're intrigued. There's people that are into prophecy. There's so much stuff that God put inside of people in this one room. There's so much diversity you can hardly track it. And yet we're called to walk in the unity of faith. So he can't be talking about uniformity. He can't be talking about Hitler and everybody looking the same, acting the same, liking the same. So the unity of faith must be something else. The unity of faith is in the midst of those burnings, in the midst of those callings, is you waking up for the same reason. You opening your eyes in the morning, pursuing the same truth. Watch this. 
You could be called to children. You could be called to the homeless. You could be called to the nations. You could feel like you're going to be a missionary. You could feel like you're just going to be a Sunday school teacher. You feel like you're just going to be working in that sound booth and you love it and you want to serve your church. And, and, and it's all amazing and everybody together makes the whole of him and nobody's less important. True? But watch this. No matter what that niche is in your heart, we can all wake up to become love and manifest his image. And if we miss that, it's not the unity of faith. All of a sudden, your ministry is more important, and without my ministry, they wouldn't have nothing. And if we wouldn't intercede, nothing would happen on the earth. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we miss the whole point again. And we realize we're finding our identity through what we do for him instead of becoming like him. And that's why people that go to church tend to live like this. And you ask them how they're doing and they tell you their two biggest struggles, meaning they're identifying with their trouble, not their revelation. And now they're only as good as things are going instead of as good as he is inside of them. Man, that's solid good preaching. It's just right. Makes your life happy in God. Because it takes away what I used to call trouble. I don't see trouble anymore. I see people that were made for his image that he paid a price to redeem. I don't see how lost they are. I see how much he loves them. Everybody's worth this price to him. He proved it by dying on a cross. One price for all men. Everybody matters. You wouldn't be sitting here with any inkling of desire in your heart towards God if you didn't matter because grace made your heart alive. While we were in darkness, light started to come. While we were in the dark, he started to speak. When we didn't know a thing, our hearts started to wander and get drawn and attracted. Grace just started to pull us towards him. You can run from it. You can ignore it. But every man thinks about it. Why does every man think about it at times? Why does it run through his head? Because grace is alive on the earth. God's voice is alive and love never fails and he's whispering. Whoever did something and you knew you shouldn't do it and you couldn't get that out of your head but you were still doing it but you couldn't get out of your head that you shouldn't be doing it but you still did it but you couldn't get it out of your head. That's God saying, love you. There's so much more than that. There's a higher truth. You have a greater destiny. That sure beats a God that's saying, what do you think you're doing? You're supposed to look to me and love me. That's how our parents, some of our parents conveyed God. Well, God saw that. Well, you must have really hurt the heart of God. No, you didn't hurt the heart of God. God hurts for you. He loves. He's not hurt. He doesn't take account of suffered wrong. He's not molded by men. He molds men. Come on, God's not a basket case needing counsel because of us. <laughs> He's rock solid. He's the rock of ages, unmovable and unshakable. No turning or shifting of shadow. Why? Because He's God. Because He's love. And He made man for His image. And the image of God is love. So the reason man's on the earth is the image of God. The Bible says we're to behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and being transformed into his same image, even from glory to glory, or from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Second Corinthians 4. Colossians 3.10 says, put off the old man in his deeds, put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Do you see the purpose of the cross? The whole purpose of the cross is to restore the image back into men of the Almighty God so that God's Spirit could come again and live inside of men and shine through men. This is not about all your prayers getting answered and blessings. This is about your life changing and being transformed. It's about you coming out of darkness into the light. It's about you making peacemakers for they're the sons of God. It's about you living with a pure heart because it's possible because he gives you a new one. 
Because the pure in heart shall. Wow. This is not about blessings and favor. We already have it. This is about transformation and life change. This is about God getting inside and 180 everything we thought was right. You grow up, don't get your hope up. Bible says get it sky high. You grow up, what you see is what you get. Bible says never live by what you see, which is unseen is eternal. The opposites. Can't, well, what you don't know won't hurt you. What you don't know is destroying you, and in all you're getting, get understanding. See, we were homeschooled in a wrong home. We were trained by a lie. And there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but its way leads to destruction. And he said it two chapters later in Proverbs 16, 14 and 16. When God says the same exact thing in two chapters, we probably better listen. There's a way that seemeth right. Well, yeah, but I feel, well, they shouldn't. Well, how come they always got it? Well, why did God ever? See, when that mindset, when you see what that's producing in you, that should give away that it can't be God because look what it's producing. Giving you a right to be less than him, giving you a right to be discouraged, giving you a right to judge others. <sighs> if what you're believing and feeling and acting on and thinking and snap judging in isn't producing life, it cannot be the Lord. He gives you life, and He gives you life even more. The way that seems right to man has tutored every one of us. None of us had to go to school to learn how to be jealous or full of pride or angry or frustrated. We just passed without study. Why? Because every man was born into every man for himself. He was created for God's image, but when the image was lost through sin, every man was born into Adam. Every man was born into what was lost. And every man was for himself. Every one of us tried to find our identity along the way. Every one of us from young up was living the rat race of trying to feel important and be valued and trust others and need others and want others and want esteemed and, and want told we were awesome because we didn't believe it by a young age. And every one of us was looking for love. Mostly in all the wrong places. It's not just a song, it's true. Why? Because when man sinned, he got cut off from love and became in need of love. And every man was born into Adam and you must be born. And somehow we turned it into a prayer that favors us and takes us to heaven instead of puts heaven back into us. Somehow we just made it a self-serving message that takes care of me. Instead of a message that changes me and brings me back to truth. So that I can follow him, not just need him. Man, that's the gospel. I don't want anything else. I don't want you to think anything else. I don't want you to live anything else or pursue anything else. Because this place brings life. Because you don't think for yourself, you think for his kingdom. And if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything that matters will be added unto you. Come on, seek ye first His kingdom. Think about His kingdom and how it works and what is inside of you. Don't look here. Don't look there. It's in you. So go preach saying the kingdom of God is here. What's he talking about? Getting a bullhorn and walking down the street? The kingdom of God is here. No, you'll look like a crazy man. What he's talking about is go saying... Live a life in a manner worthy of Him. And when people look at your life, they say, that's the kingdom. Shine as a light and hold forth the word of life. It says, do all things without grumbling or complaining so you can be seen as innocent children in the midst of a world that's twisted. Isn't that powerful? He's saying complaining is unscriptural. He's saying there's no such thing as a complaining Christian. Wow! Why? Because you love not your own life unto death. You gave it all up for Him and His image and His great name. He said, if any man come after me, let him first. What? Why? Because you were never made for you. You were made for His image. So if any man comes, don't just come for healing. Just don't come for blessing. Just don't come so your marriage gets restored. Just don't come so your finances get back on track. You deny yourself. And you pick up your cross and never let sin against you produce and give a right for sin in you. You overcome evil with good, not evil for evil, 
You tone down a harsh word with a kind word. You let mercy triumph over judgment. You cover a multitude of sin with love. You carry your cross. And you don't let life decide how you're doing. You let the life in you already settle that. And you follow him. That's Christianity. Getting your name in a book called Life and a Trumpet One Day Blowing is not the motivation. The motivation is new life through Jesus Christ. I'm glad the trumpet's going to blow and I'm glad we're in the book. And I'm rejoicing about that. I'm not upset that we have everlasting life. Let's stop making that the point. The point is transformation coming out of darkness into the light. Of course we're going to live forever. God didn't make man to die. Man died when sin entered the earth. Jesus took care of sin, so we're going to live forever. He's the Redeemer. He made it all right. Of course we're going to live forever. We're one with the Eternal One who will never die. The everlasting life, we always make the goal. Transformation of life is the goal. Read your Bible. We've, we've been subtly, I'm not saying pastor, I'm saying the church at large, we've been subtly deceived into preaching a message that benefits us instead of changes us. So people are seeking benefit and can still stay frustrated and even mad at God. Which proves we don't understand the gospel. Because he's always good. You say, well, if he was good, why'd I lose my job? If he was good, why'd I lose my spouse? If he was good, why'd my car break down and I got laid off in the same week? Well, let me ask you a question. If he wasn't good, why'd he send his son while we were lost in sin? Well, if he wasn't good, why'd an innocent God become flesh and hang on a tree when he didn't have to? Because love said he had to. Because he said, I know the truth about you. I know your beginnings. I know your destiny. I know your potential. And I know what you look like when I'm in you and you're surrendered. You're worth paying for the highest price I'm in. I'm investing my life into you so that my life can get in you and you can be what you were intended to be. We've turned it into a prayer that takes us to heaven someday and blessings through life. <laughs> Instead of oneness and communion with Almighty God, restored back to the beginning as if we've never sinned, unveiled and one with Him. Yay. <laughs> That's what's wrong with me. <laughs> That's what I have. And that's what you're created for. I'm just going to make a bold statement. And if you feel like you need to clean it up or pull me off the stage, if you're living for anything else, you're living for something that he didn't come for as far as the point and priority. We have focused on aspects of the gospel and made them the majors. If you're not pursuing transformation, you'll stay the same in your disposition, attitudes, and motivations, and it will get you in trouble. The why behind your life is what he's after. Why are you alive? Why did you wake up today? What's the motivation? What's the reason for being? It's still a question men are searching out. I found my answer in the truth. His name is Jesus. And I said yes to him. And he packed his bags and moved inside of me. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so now I understand. So here we are 21 years later, and I'm figuring I'm either the most deceived man you've ever met, or I'm on to something. <laughs> I'm either whacked and deceived, or I'm free. I got all my chips on free. We'll find out one day, but I'm banking on free. Because <laughs> see, I live with me, and I know me, and I know what makes me tick, and I know my heart, and I know my ways. And I have no trouble looking in the mirror. My conscience is crystal clear. And if I would do anything to violate that, I would deal with that in a heartbeat without delay. Because he's made me more than that, and I won't live that way. I'm my own best friend when it comes to that stuff. I don't need you as an accountability partner. I have a good one. It's called my own conscience. Hmm. Now I'm not in this thing for a blessing. I'm in this thing for his honor and his glory. In his great name. And I want people to meet me and know that they've got a glimpse of him in some way, even if they figure it out later. But I don't want to send any other message. You guys good? This is what Sunday's all about.
just coming and getting stirred up and realizing why we're here and looking around and saying, hey, we're a part of something. It's not a cot and it's not freaky and they're not controllers. And we're not in a little country club where we're comfortable so we escape from the world. I love coming here because I'm so safe. You're safe everywhere when your life's not your own. You don't have to put walls around to protect yourself from people. They can't touch you if you understand. You say, well, I get emotionally abused only if you don't know who you are. You can't emotionally abuse somebody that knows who they are. You can say anything you want. You can do anything repetitively. You can't emotionally abuse someone that knows. You try to emotionally abuse me. You will get emotionally abused trying. (laughs) I'm telling you. Because I didn't wake up for what I can get from you. And I didn't wake up this morning with you owing me anything. You owe no man anything but to love. So now you can't touch me in the wrong way anymore. All you can do is encourage me. And I'm encouraged. You can add to that, I guess. (laughs) Never felt like I needed that in my whole Christian life. But I'm sure it wouldn't hurt. (laughs) But I do know this. You can't take away what you see in me. Because I don't see you in a way that would give you the power. I love you. I don't need you. I love you. There's a difference. When I say I don't need you, we need each other to fulfill this thing. We need to lock arms and run the race. We need one another to manifest the body of Christ. When I say I don't need you, I don't need you to know who I am. I can only know me through him. And through that, I have the greatest look of you I've ever had. If I need you to find who I am, then I'm only as good as you're seeing me and doing it. And then I have reasons for being less than him because of you. And then I'm saying stuff like, well, I wouldn't be in this place if it wasn't for Johnny and and, and, and Jill over there. Well, did you know what Freddie did to me last week? And all of a sudden, I'm letting a human being decide how I'm doing and singing Jesus as well. And then what gets exposed is I'm more needy than I realize. And I'm looking for everyone to do me right. I'm almost have this weird, without saying it, belief that God's there to make sure that happens. That is not the gospel. (laughs) If Jesus lived that way, he'd have been in trouble quick. Do you know the first day Jesus preached, they were impressed for about two minutes when he opened the scroll and started reading because there's authority in him. Because he is the revelation. He didn't just come and preach out of his Bible study. He's the revelation. He's the word made flesh. So when he starts reading the word, he's like reading himself. It's really crazy good. So when he starts reading the scroll, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. They're like, wow. Right? And they're like, whoa, this dude. And a few moments in, they go, hey, is he talking about us? Like, yeah, kill him. <laughs> They're impressed with his speech, impressed with his authority. They said, wait a minute, he's talking about us. Kill him. They tried to push him off a cliff the first day he preached. Now, I don't know how encouraged you'd be <laughs> if you got your big debut and Nathan hands you the mic <laughs> and they stormed you and tried to kill you. <laughs> You'd be crying and debriefing and where'd I go wrong and why don't they like me and maybe I don't matter. And I... <laughs> nope, he just gets right back in the saddle and keeps riding. <laughs> it's amazing. Do you know why Jesus is like that? Because he's Jesus, because he's love. There's a difference. Don't sell him cheap and just say because he's Jesus and make him a special man because he's love. He called you and me to be loved. He said, if God loved us this way, ought we not love one another? If God made man in his image and God is love, then from the beginning we've had the created value to love. He said, I give you a new commandment, yet it's not a new commandment, it's the one you've had from the beginning. And in the beginning, God. 
The reason man is on the planet is to be like him. We were trained the total opposite of that. And we think we're barely saved and by the skin of our teeth we'll always be wretches and slip through the crack. Don't anyone in this church believe that? You live by the Spirit. You don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You walk in righteousness. You walk in the light as he's in the light. And then there's no shadows or cover. You have fellowship with one another. You're not living in the dark. You're out in the open with nothing to hide. Come on. Christian living is not what our lives have been. It's following Jesus. It doesn't mean you won't ever make a mistake. And it's not about perfection. It's about purity, growing, and maturing. Taking responsibility, holding yourself accountable, and living upright and truthful. We can all do that if we say yes. That's why there's a judgment. I'm not saying that to be weird at the end. What I'm saying is every man has the right to yield to truth. What you do with your life decides what you believe. And how you live is your faith revealed. <laughs> so you can say, oh, I believe, but you can let everything else matter more. And then you prove you really don't believe their words. Your life is what's looked at. Your life lived determines your faith. The life you live reveals what you really believe and give yourself to. And you could say all the right things and manifest the less. So be a steward of your heart this morning and let me cheer you on and encourage you in this race and tell you that everybody's in, everybody can run well, Holy Spirit's with us and God's not changing his mind. So I think we have every reason to run well. You can choose to get your eyes on other things. I would encourage you not to. I would say, don't let something matter more that doesn't matter most. Please be careful that you don't say, yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through right now. Do you hear it? Now that I'm preaching, I'm not being insensitive. I understand we got trials and stuff. Come on, I could do that too. We don't have joy because all our circumstantial ducks are in a row. We have joy because we're not carrying the burden of thinking for ourselves anymore. So salvation has come. <laughs> and I thought you used to be my problem. <laughs> I used to think it was you or the devil. It had to be one or the other. And sometimes you looked like him, so I figured it had to be one or the other. I found out it was me. I was the biggest problem in my life. Thinking for me, living for me. You can be a Christian for you. It's unscriptural. You're not a Christian for you. You're a Christian for His image, His nature, and others. Is this clean? Is this safe? Is this fair? Please don't say you don't know what I'm going through. Well, brother, you don't know what it was like growing up. It's easy for you to say you don't know the trials I've known. You might not be aware that I might know more trials in the natural sea. Just because you see me like this, you think I've had an easier ride. I wonder if the passion in me is because of the fire. I wonder if the passion is because he's Lord. I wonder if the passion is because I actually see and believe what I'm saying. You say, well, I never had a dad that gave me a model and told me he loved me. Well, I wonder if I didn't. Yeah, but I was touched wrong when I was four. I wonder if I was when I was four. See? See, here's what we do. We decide our lives through our lives, compare ourselves among ourselves. Paul said we're not wise. Now we have to survey everybody to see who's been through the most hell. And then all we can have is sympathy and then sing it's all about heaven. I don't get it. None of that stuff that happened to me in my life has anything to do with what I'm talking about today. It separates me from all that. That was a lie. It's called the fall of man. It was sin trying to consume another generation, shut down another destiny, quench another light. It was sin trying to reproduce itself after its own kind. And here's Jesus. Come out from among them. Child. The last thing I need to do is be trapped feeling sorry for myself now that he's come. It's the loneliest party you've ever been to and you know it. And the only thing you can do is find a couple people that agree with how you feel and they become your friends. And there's no help for the rest of your life. You don't need that kind of support. You need somebody strong enough and humble enough and loving enough to look you in the eyes and take you by the hand and say, Honey, 
buddy. You got to stop thinking this way. It's producing death in you. You don't need a right to be this way. This way is a lie. I'm sorry what they did to you, but what's that have to do with who you're called and created to be? Come on, rise out of that thing. Throw those shackles off. Stop believing those lies. Nobody can make up for yesterday. You have the present and things to come. Let's start now. That's what you need in your life. Not somebody that says, oh, honey, I'm sorry they did that to you. You must be so hurt. Let's pray. That's not spiritual. Holy Spirit's not initiating that. That's human empathy. He's not even in the prayer. That's your hurt relating to their hurt. And you know if you'd be in their shoes, you'd feel the same way, and all you can do is give them sympathy. You can't give them freedom and truth. You guys all right? Okay. What time do you usually end? We got 11 service, don't we? These Sunday mornings are a challenge for me, man. <laughs> but I understand them. I, I love Sunday morning. It doesn't have to be some long drawn out and a bunch of ministry stuff. Here's the main point of Sunday. And like last night we met, I said, when the Bible says you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, what's the reason listed in your Bible? In order that we might, who knows what it says in Hebrews 10, stir one another up in love and good works. Why? So nobody gets deceived and turns inward and lets their life start speaking louder than truth. So that all of a sudden we aren't just ministering to everyone all the time because they're not encouraged and we expect our hearts to be broken because they probably had challenging weeks. That is not Christianity. Some men build their whole ministry on preaching that way and calling people up to be mended and, and, and healed and restored. And I'm saying, why aren't we teaching why you don't have to be broken? Why are we always expected to be overwhelmed by last week's events and by the boss's attitude? Why are we praying for a new job because we can't stand our boss? Why aren't we crying for him and wanting to be there so we can influence and look for opportunities to shine in the light? Why are we making it all about us and our well-being instead of the world around us that needs to know him? Come on, guys. This is why we gather to talk about this stuff and get convicted and challenged so that we don't innocently, ignorantly make mistakes that aren't productive and find that six, seven, eight, ten years are behind us now because we didn't understand. And in all you're getting, get understanding. You guys good? I mean, you just go to school and all of a sudden you're just overwhelmed because you don't fit in or because somebody laughed or because now they're talking and chatting on the social media and you feel like your life is devastated. I'll tell you what your generation needs to see. Somebody that's unshakable, that's so secure, that doesn't need the praises of men because they know the presence of God in the secret place and they're secure in who He is inside of them. And they're not projecting and they're not being arrogant and boastful. They're just okay. And after a while, people look and think, I think they're okay. <laughs> yeah? That sure beats being impressed and influenced by everything that's not impressive. Yeah. yeah. Man, it's just good Sunday morning stuff. This is why we gather. It's not because we're doing our Sunday morning because this is the church we belong to. We come to stay sharp and focused in the race that we're in and look around and realize we ain't running alone. And together, we make a difference within our spheres of influence. We cover ground. Yeah. So you come here to get er encouraged and sharpened and edified so you can leave looking a little more like him than when you came. Yeah? I'll close with something I already said. What you're thinking isn't encouraging and building up and edifying your life. What you're dwelling on, running over in your mind, and musing on, isn't producing life in you. It's a lie. What you're dwelling on is a lie. Because He gives life. And He gives life even more. And even if you have to hash through things, there's always an encouraging answer in Him and a way to see what's profitable. We're not people with a million problems and need help. We're people with one amazing answer and he's enough. Are you hearing me? That's not hype. That's the truth. My life is complete in him. And now I can finally live this way. I don't bring God through the eye of the needle of my life. I bring my life through the eye of the needle of God. And we're going to stitch something that looks good. Amen?
Can I pray over you and bless you this morning? Father, I just do you mind standing to your feet and just honoring the Lord and 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 if you want to, you don't have to do this, and I'm not going to look around. See, see how these guys right here are stretching out with their hands raised? That's awesome. Look at that. I was going to say, if you want to, if, if you want to say to God, just this is a statement. I, I hear what this man's saying. I want to give my life to these things, and I receive this grace. God, this has my attention. I want to live this way. Keep helping me and fathering me, and, and, and I'll steward this truth. I want you to lift your hands if you want to to God. It's just a sign of posture, guys. It doesn't mean you're going to label, be labeled a charismatic. It, it means that I'm lifting my hands to God as a sign of surrender and I'm saying, mold me and shape me like clay, clay, great mighty potter. Make me everything you've desired and everything you've intended from the beginning. Lord, I don't want the way that seems right to man to rule me. I don't want just degenerate feelings and unrenewed mindsets to rob me of the destiny you've placed inside of me. God, you put your kingdom in me. You put your life in me. You put your nature in me. I'm not just here for a blessing. I'm not just here to catch a break. I'm here to be like you. And as I read and as I listen to men and women speak of you and as I meditate and muse and, and think about your name, I thank you for fathering me and keeping me in the light of these things and, and letting these truths be the screen on my eyes and, and the filters in my ears. And I thank you for growing me up into you. And this morning, I'm not going to focus where I haven't been. I'm going to focus on where I'm heading. It's not about if I've missed it. It's about if I'm running towards you. And I'm going to run well, King Jesus. You have fixed my eyes on you. Father, I ask that love be formed and perfected in this house. I pray that every family would know your peace and your presence. That God, it would take one in a house to make peace. That if there be any uprising, someone would rise up in the way of peace. And just things would come to a place of truth. Lord God, I just pray against any animosity, any ill feelings, anything that doesn't produce life, that we would be so convicted in our own hearts that those things would quickly fade and die. Lord God, let love be among us. Let your great name be revealed and glorified. And let people within our spheres of influence know that you sent your Son because we walk one with you. Lord God, I thank you that love is evangelistic. I thank you that we're not under pressure to reach people. I thank you we're not under pressure to evangelize X amount. Just teach us to walk in love because love is evangelistic. And put what you care about inside of every one of our hearts. And that revelation understanding of this gospel fill our eyes and our understanding. I bless this house. I bless every family represented, every young life. And I say, Lord, let destinies be fulfilled in this place. Let people be trained up and empowered and equipped. And Lord, I pray this over this house. And I, and I pray that, that these two precious pastors would see this in this house. That, that this is not a house that has folks that continually go up and down. And that two, three years later, they'll, they'll have to look and try to wonder where they've headed and went. But I pray that, Lord God, they would enjoy an experience like like rejoicing parents and, and see people run well, raise up, and never look back. I pray that this house would be a ascending place of maturity, a ascending place of Christ-likeness. That, that people would be touched by the people that get formed in the grace that's on this house. And God, not that they would have to promote the name of a church, that, but lives changed would promote something that you're doing. Lives changed would be the testimony in men's hearts. And I'm asking, Lord God, for that kind of strength in this house, that there'd be a no-nonsense, yet full of grace, not pressured, not in legalism, not in works, just a life flow of grace, no looking back, no compromise, just set hand and face to the plow. God, I ask for that to be established in this work. And I pray that it would disperse into this community and reveal your great name. I pray that young people would continue to rise up and show up here with a true hunger and desire in their heart that you yourself, Lord, would plant it in them and that no one could snatch that hunger out of them. God, I ask that you make them strong and full of valor. God, I thank you for it. Bless this house, God every heart represented here. 
I pray in a personal way you touch and encourage them this day. God bless your holy name and thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I'm just going to close with that, guys. It's the morning of teaching and truth to me. Pastor, whatever you want to do, if you want to pray, whatever you want to do, you're the pastor.